We'd like to welcome everybody out for our first um, training session. Uh, I decided that I would go ahead and kick it off seeing as how we're hosting it. And that way we can kind of get the format set because some people are a little more easily distracted and disrupted. Um, this is not an open forum where you can just raise your hand and ask questions anywhere along the process. We've got a number of things we're going to cover tonight. I'm going to be as clear and concise as I can. And before I go to the next segment, I will ask if there's any questions at that time. Okay? Now, how many of you brought something to write with to take notes? A few of you. Good, good. I have. Um, our fearless leader was trying to get people to hurry up and uh, draw up note, uh, syllabus notes or something. Like, you know, uh, we'll, we'll give you a textbook to, to learn. I was like, no, that ain't going to happen. Some of the subjects we're going to be covering, I'm opening up tonight with uh, what I've entitled Homesteading Preppers Pantry Recipes. So I'm going to teach you some things tonight. Some of it you're going to be familiar with. Some of it you may not have heard of before. Uh, but that's tonight. And we're going to try to end at 8 o'clock as close as we can. And then next week, we're going to have Gary and Reverend Bob are going to be team teaching first aid for an hour. Uh, how many of you caught Gary's teaching on a Monday night a few weeks ago? How many of you were able to take that in the 15 minutes he had? Now, I was like, where did you get that bag of tricks at? I'd like to see what else is in there. And he didn't even get his whole bag empty. So what we want to do with this is expand on the teachings that you're getting a little taste of on Monday night but give the, the teachers an hour to be able to teach. And if it's applicable, like the first day, you want to know how to apply direct pressure or something like that, then they can teach for half an hour, and then we can practice what we learned on one another. Uh, we've even got a CPR dummy yeah. available to where we practice doing stuff like that. Or if somebody like Rick's going to be teaching later in the month, because we're going to give him a whole hour. Poor guy, he never gets past radios in his 15 minutes. And then that's that, we ought to hurry up and go. So we're going to give him a whole hour later this month to where he can go into all kinds of stuff. We're going to give Gene Ann uh, an hour to teach us and bring us up to speed with the information she has to this point on child trafficking. So you can know what to look for, how to spot it, what to do. So we're going. To, these are going to be ongoing things. So Brandy's going to be teaching one night as well on how to defend your castle or whatever he chooses to call it, but he's our, he's our defensive leader and our strategist in that regard. So we're all going to be taking turns rotating through, and the same subjects won't necessarily be taught every month, but it'll probably be a good rotation of the same, pretty close to the same speakers every month, so that you can build each month on the previous month's training and have a, a better retention for the material that you're going to be going over tonight. So I brought some things out with us to show and tell, uh, but before I begin, can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the Flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Remain standing for a minute while we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time to be able to assemble together in a place where we have the freedom to do so and the comfort that you provided. Lord, lead us and guide us and instruct us in all of our ways and particularly with the subject matter for this evening that we might be prepared for that which is to come. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You can sit down. I won't ask you to stand up again. We're not going to take an offering or give an all call or none of that kind of stuff so you guys don't have to white knuckle it. That happens all Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, there is a scripture in the Bible I do want to make a reference to. And it says, I believe it's in the book of James, that he that fails to provide for his own family is worse than an infidel. And there are a lot of people that we talk to on a day-to-day -day basis to try to tell them what's coming, and they either 
refuse to wake up, they're clueless, or they think, okay, I threw some stuff in the pantry, I'm prepared, I'm ready. And none of us know exactly when the shaking is going to begin, but we all know that the shaking is going to happen at some time. We don't know how long it's going to last. We don't know how severe it will be. So I talk to some people and they say, well, I have everything in my freezer. My freezer is packed clear full. Freezers are great if everything works like normal. But what happens if the power goes out or your freezer breaks down? You, you can't just take all that frozen stuff and chuck it in the refrigerator and keep it good. So you've got a problem. So you have to be smart about how you prepare the things that you're trying to lay up for hard times or to be able to help somebody else, another family member or a neighbor in hard times. So we can't cover every contingency, but I want to take it to worst case scenario. Because you can say, well, I got a generator and I got 20 gallons of gas. Well, that's great. But what happens if you run out of gas? What happens if your generator breaks? I like to quote Rick, two is one and one is none. So when it comes to your preparing, if you only have one plan, you got all your eggs in one basket, and the handle on that basket breaks, there went all your eggs, if, if you understand the analogy. So what I decided to do was, I'm an old country boy, and I knew what it was like to grow up with no electricity. I knew what it was like to go without running water. And I learned to develop these skills over years of watching my grandmother and my mother when I was growing up. How many of you had relatives like that that you watched them can back when you were a kid? How many of you can now? Several of you. All right, canning is not a difficult prospect. And I want to go over some things with you tonight that I've learned. Uh, I'll call it YouTube University. Uh, maybe you can't beat YouTube. Why are you going to watch that garbage on regular TV where they're all sleeping around and chasing one another and saying stupid things, it's ignorant, makes you mad, want to throw rocks at the TV? Flip that thing over on YouTube and increase your knowledge. It's at your fingertips. Anything I'm sharing with you tonight, I learned from hours of research on YouTube. And I have to start with this forward. None of the things I'm going to share with you tonight are USDA approved. This is referred to as rebel canning. It's referred to as Amish canning. But the Amish been doing this for, de for generations and it's safe and reliable. It's just not USDA approved, which is another alphabet agency of the federal government. Boo. <laughs> I don't trust them, do you? No. no. So you can try these things, see if you like them. Um, try it at your own risk. Watch two or three. There's lots of different people that are teaching these things on YouTube. So any subject that you type in that I'm going to share with you in the search engine, there's going to be numbers of videos that you can watch. Go through, pay attention to each one. When you find ones that seem to be agreeing with one another, you've got two or three different people that are teaching you the same thing with a slight variation, that's probably credible. I only had one that I found that didn't have anything else until last night, night before last, I believe it was, I saw somebody else that did it, but they did a different technique. So we're going to start tonight with shelf-stable milk. Now I want to show you something. How many of you have been to the grocery store and seen these boxes of milk? Yes. How many of you have never seen this before? Okay, so the rest of you just won't raise your hand no matter what I ask. <laughs> <laughs> these are ultra high temperature, shelf stable quarts of milk. I think that's what's in there, 32 fluid ounces. That, that's quart, right? right? Yeah. Two pints is a quart. You can open this up and it's ready to use. It's shelf stable. It's not like canned milk where it has a different flavor and you got to add water to it and it's okay to bake it with, but if you try to drink it, it just doesn't taste the same, does it? This tastes just like regular milk that you got out of the refrigerator, but it's shelf stable. 
problem with this is this is hard to find. Have you noticed the shortage of supply when you go try to pick this up and they don't have any? Well, the other factor is it's really expensive. So I found out how to do ultra high temperature shelf stable milk at home. No store needed. Oh. <laughs> how many of you are interested in that? Yep. Here's what it looks like. I put these up last week. I put seven pints up today. And if you pass this around, don't drop it. You'll notice there's still a little bit of the cream left on the top of this because this came straight from the cow that I get with my milk share farmer that I paid for a share of the cow and then I pay so much for each week in the quarter and I get a half a gallon of fresh milk every week that has the cream. Now when I packed, did this batch up out of the half gallon, I got three pints of milk and about a half and the rest of it was cream that I pulled off the top that I was able to make a whole stick of fresh butter at home. And it was pretty impressive. It turned out really well, if I do say so myself. And I'll teach you how to do that one in a little bit too. I'm going to have to keep moving or I'm going to get behind. You already seen it. You little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys can pass that around. Don't shake it up because then the cream won't be noticeable for everybody else. But you skipped on. See, see he snubs you. Do you see that? <laughs> when you get ready to use it, all you have to do is just shake the jar. The cream reincorporates. And I put it in pints because if you're going to put it on the shelf to cook with, usually a pint will give you everything you need. And if there's something left over, oh shucks, I had to drink it. But if you put it in a quart and you open the quart, there's no refrigeration. Now what are you going to do with the rest of that quart of milk once you've opened it because it's, it's going to go waste. So I did it in pints. Now if you're going to use that to feed your kid's cereal with and they're going to go through a whole quart, then put it in the quart jars. It's the same recipe. It's just what size container do you want to put it in. All right. Now what you're going to need, I'll give you a list. The materials that you're going to need to do this, and this will, by the way, give you shelf-stable milk for up to two years. That jar of milk will sit on the pantry and still be good in two years with no refrigeration. I thought that was outstanding. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. You need a pressure canner. That is the preferred method. If you do not have a pressure canner, you can do it in a water bath canner, but it's going to change the properties a little bit and you're going to take a lot longer to get it done. If you don't know the difference between a pressure canner and a water bath canner, the pressure canner is the one with the pressure gauge on the top. It's big and it's heavy and it's kind of scary to use if you're not used to it. This is a water bath canner. You can get these at Walmart. I bought this one a couple weeks ago for $25. Comes with a rack on the inside of it. It's porcelain on top. Enamel on steel. These things last forever. It'll hold nine pints, I think, or seven quarts. On the bottom. I'm going to turn it over. So I brought this just to show it to you. Seven Do you seven. have to have one of these? No. Do you have an aluminum stock pot big enough to hold a quart jar? Mm -hmm. Then you can put a lid on it and you can do the same thing this does. All of this is called is it because it's thinner, it heats up the water faster, it doesn't take as long to heat, and it cools off quicker. But you can use any stock pot with the lid that's big enough to hold the jars that you want to can, and you have to cover the jars by with about two inches of water. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. So you can't have the lid of the jar come right up to here. That won't work. You have to have two inches of head space with the water over top of the jar so when the water boils, it's covered in it and it keeps the heat going consistent all the way through. All right? Now, onward. You're going to need enough clean wash jars with lids and rings to hold the amount of milk to be preserved. You can use this for gallons of milk from the grocery store. You can go ahead and do that. If you want to can up heavy cream, you can can heavy cream. You can do the same process. It's the same amount of time. It's the exact same thing. Just changes the contents for what you decided you wanted to do. All right? Now, if you're using farm fresh milk, take the cream off the top as much as you can get. And I use a turkey baster in the jar just and then squirt it off until I've gotten down to where I can't get any more cream without pulling milk and then ask why there's still some cream in the jar. Then you set that off to the side, and then you can go ahead and use that for making butter, or if you want 
to save it for putting it in your coffee, whatever, but don't throw it away. That's the good stuff. All right? You want to place the milk in the jars, and as you're passing that around, you'll notice there's a one inch headspace. Now, what we mean by one inch of headspace is when you look at the top of the jar, it gets up to where the, the threads are that this screws down onto. Right below that is, is as high as you want to go. So one inch is about from there to there. So where the jar starts to taper in, you want to stop right there because if you don't and it boils, it can end up pushing out of the jar. I actually had one I did this afternoon, had a little bit of leak come out of the side of it because that one was just a whisker too full. Little part, right? But I don't think it hurt it. It looks like it's sealed up. And if I want to open one to try it, that'll be the first one I'll try. And if the milk's sour, I'll know that one didn't set up right. But the ring did pop. So it did what it was supposed to do. Now, what you have to do, and that's why I want to go ahead and cover this one as far as with the pressure canner. Everything else that I'm going to share with you tonight, you can do water bath. You can still do the milk water bath, but you have to keep it on a rolling boil for two hours. And I watched her when she got those out and looked at them, and it looked more like can milk in color. It was kind of off-white. It wasn't nice and white. It looked like fresh, regular milk. And when she opened it up to try it, she put some on some cereal, went to give it to her daughter, and her daughter tasted it and went, taste burnt. So it had a slight burnt taste because you're boiling the milk for two hours at a hard rolling boil. It's not going to keep the same flavor as it did before you did that to it. It's simple enough. When you put it in the pressure canner, however, I did the research and I found out that to make that ultra high temperature shelf milk, they have to bring that milk up to 260 to 305 degrees temperature for like five seconds. And that's it. They put it in there, seal it up, and now it's shelf stable. It doesn't need refrigerator. Who knows what temperature water boils at? 212 degrees, very good. Does it get hotter if you put more fire under it? No. Nope, it stays 216 degrees. So I did research and I found out the mechanics of how pressure canning actually works. How many of you know how it actually works? Two of them. Yeah, I found out, it was pretty cool. When you put that water under pressure and it builds up steam inside of that pressure canner, it's raising the temperature. And so you put that, uh, you go ahead and take cold jars, you know, room temperature milk and tap water and put everything in there, pour your milk in, wipe the top, put the lid on, put the ring on and set them in the pressure canner. And then I turned the burner up to low, medium low, just so it would gradually start to warm up the water and the jars and the milk. And once I got to that point, then I went ahead and put the lid on it, and let it get warmer until it warmed up everything real good. Then I turned it up to eight, turn it up to high, lock and lock the lid and leave your vent open. If you use a jiggler, leave the jiggler off. And you have to wait until that gets to a hard steam that's pushing out. It's ready to whistle like a tea kettle. You can tell when it gets that way. When it does that, then you want to go ahead and I got a steam vent on mine, so I just close the petcock, and it'll start slowly building up pressure when it gets hot. Well, you do the same thing with your jiggler. You put your jiggler back on on 10 pounds, watch the gauge. That's not going to take very long. Watch the gauge until the needle gets up to 10 pounds, and if you want to go a little past 10 just for good measure, say go up to like 11 pounds, and then turn the burner off. That's it. You don't have to set the timer. You don't have to do nothing else. Just wait for the pressure to drop. Your little valve thing to and shut off to let you know all the pressure's off. Open the lid. Make sure you don't steam yourself. Hold it away from you. And then take them out. Set them on the countertop on a towel. And just wait for them to seal like everything else does. And you'll hear them pop, pop. I had a couple pop as soon as I took the lid off. Um, when you do that, it, what it's doing, while it's under pressure, the temperature inside is going from 212 to 240 degrees. I didn't know that. Because it doesn't give you a temperature gauge on the pressure, it just tells you how many pounds of pressure it is. So I learned that under pressure, 
you're increasing the temperature of the water and the contents inside of that, that's how pressure canning works to kill the botulism spores and the other things that would make you sick. We say, I thought you said 260 to 305. I did. There's logarithms that the USDA came up with for safe canning. So where they do that box milk for five seconds at 260 degrees, if you looked on their logarithm tables, you get it up to 240 degrees, five seconds isn't long enough, but 10 minutes is. And so what you're doing is you're doing a little lower temperature than the government does it, but you're extending the time, which equals out to the same thing. So it's reached the temperature it needs to make that milk the same as what you bought at the store in that box. And it's in that quart jar. Now you can set it on the shelf, pint jar, whatever it was, the cream, the milk, whatever, you can put that up there and it will stay shelf stable, no refrigeration and ready to use for up to two years. And I was like, wow, that's cool. Yeah. I want to do that. See, I'm wondering if we end up with uh, corona mass ejection from the sun or class three solar flares, that's a big one, Rick, that knocks out the solar power, that knocks out the grid, your refrigerator's not going to work. None of your electronics is going to work. And if you had your bed on the freezer and the generator, guess what happened? Your freezer and your generator were fried too. So if somebody decides they want to pop an electromagnetic pulse weapon off over, high, over the United States and the power grid goes out, or some raghead to terrorist goes to one of those locations where those three sections join together with a suitcase bomb and blows it up, you only got to take out one section of the grid the other two would become overloaded and very quickly there would be a massive blackout across the entire country. So you have to think in those terms. Worst case scenario, what's the best way for me to take care of the things that I spent good money for instead of going out and spending a, a fortune on the stuff that's from those Patriot sites and they put it into five gallon buckets, it's good for 20 years. Look, if you've got the money to do that and that's easy, that's fine, go ahead and do it. There's nothing wrong with it. My budget doesn't support that. So this country boy had to find another way to get it done. All right? Get her done. <laughs> all right, that's it. That's all you need to do for shelf-stable milk with a shelf life above the two years. Does anybody have any questions before we go on to shelf-stable butter? This is real easy. Yeah, Rick. I just make sure you also date the yes. list. Oh, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, painter's tape. Yeah. Which you don't know what painter's tape is. It's like show and tell. My wife's supposed to be helping me with this. She's supposed to come up I'm and doing do like. Job. She's supposed to come up and do like you know. <laughs> one. Let's make a deal or whether the price is right. <laughs> that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Painter's tape. Peels right back off the jar. You go ahead and write the date when you put it on there. And make sure you rotate your stock because if you're going to put up more than one set, use the oldest one first, not the most recent one. It sticks really well. Oops, <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Somebody else had their hand up besides Rick? Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't think I need to ask this question, but it basically would pasteurize your, like, not pasteurized milk at that point. Like if you're buying it fresh off, you're getting it. That's true, okay. but there's no way to be able to store milk without right. a pasteurization process. I understand. You put it in the freezer, when the freezer goes out, there goes your milk. Okay. So we're trying to say, how can I do this with no electricity needed once it's on the shelf? It's good for at least two years. I don't have to worry about that. And how much milk you use, that's how much you want to go ahead and figure out your rations, and then that's what you're going to have. Yeah. You had mentioned store-bought milk that you could do this to. Yeah. No, uh, you can do, buy the regular milk like you buy a cake. I don't buy milk. We, we do like almond milk or Calafia milk. Well, I can't speak to that one. I don't know. I don't, I don't imagine it would be any different. Well, no, I can, I can buy almond milk. I have the same thing. No, I'm talking about canning it. I would imagine it would be the same process. Well, that's what I mean. If, if he drinks half and half. You could do half and half like that. Heavy Just do cream. half and half in the water bath thing or whatever. Yeah, you can do it in the water bath, but it so might have a slight. It might, it's pasteurized once you do that. The, the only difference between the pressure canner and the water bath is it takes longer to water bath, 
And so the longer you keep that milk at that temperature, the more it's going to change the properties of the flavor. That's why I like using the pressure canner, because as soon as it hit 10 pounds, you turn it off. If you water bath it, you're going to have to keep it on a rolling boil that's 212 degrees for two hours. Oh. So it's going to make the milk look more like canned milk, and it may have a slight burnt taste. This one comes out to where it looks just like regular milk. You pour it out, you can't tell the difference. Now, it is going to be pasteurized, but there's no way to get shelf-stable milk without pasteurization. Right. Okay. Anybody else? Yes? I just want to say that botulism has no smell or taste. So you, to know. you might want to write the notes for what he's saying to do it right, because it has no smell or taste. Well, the nice thing about it is Rick brought his handy dandy cameras, and at some point this will end up showing up somewhere so you can sit in the comfort of your home, watch it again, get your stuff out, and kind of do a practice run without actually doing it so that you've got the process and the steps down, write, take notes. I just sat down this morning while I was drinking my coffee out on the porch and wrote out all the stuff that I learned off of watching it on YouTube and, and doing it. 